Thank you very much. I'm very honored to be here. It's my first trip to um, to Malta. I think um, the importance of art is, you know, to build to build bridges, um, and uh, it's particularly important. I think this idea of building bridges. If you think about this idea of, you know, being uh, on a on an island, because in a way, um, uh, my whole thinking really about museums, about what art can do, about what art should do. Uh, is deeply inspired by my friend, the late Edouard Lisson, who uh, was from Martinique and uh, uh, passed away a couple of years ago, but we were friends for about 20 years. Um, and uh, I learned every day you know, from his, uh, his wisdom. And Lisson, of course, um, coined this idea of the archipelago. No? And uh, he said, in a way, the archipelagos are very important because it's in these islands that the idea of creolization, which means the blend of cultures, was most brilliantly fulfilled. So continents, you know, usually reject mixings, whereas the archipelic thought makes it possible, says Glisson, to say that neither each person's identity nor the collective identity are fixed or established uh, once and for all. So that means, you know, I can change through the exchange with the other without losing or diluting my sense of self. And it's archipelic thought that teaches us this. And obviously, in the current world of the 21st century, uh, and Glissant predicted this early on, we have these two main forces. We have on the one hand uh, an extreme form of globalization, and uh, this extreme form of globalization um, uh, leads, of course, to homogenization, to the disappearance of difference. Um, even more so, it leads, as we can see now, how many years have we left, according to the news of yesterday? 12 years. So it leads to extinction. Extinction, you know, Elizabeth Colbert describes that we are living in the sixth age of, um, of mass extinction. And not only species disappear, our own species is threatened, but also uh, cultural phenomena, you know, disappear. Languages disappear. Susan Hillard has made this beautiful film about the daily disappearance of, uh, of languages. So that's one force, right? We have globalization and the homogenizing forces. On the other hand, we have in many parts of the world the counter reaction to that, which is basically a new form of localism, a new form of nationalism, which uh, rejects globalization. It's, you know, you, Clisson said it's a counter reaction, and that leads to a lack of solidarity, leads to, you know, racism leads to a, a lack of, you know, of dialogue, a lack of exchange. And as Glisson said, that of course needs to be resisted as well. And so Glisson says if we want to, you know, live in the 21st century and, and build the 21st century, we need what he called mondialité, which is uh, an embracing of a global dialogue, of building many bridges, uh, but in a way which does not homogenize. So that means a different form of globalization, you know, not the world of globalization as we have it now, and that's why he coined this notion, you know, of globality, kind of mondialité. Now, to come back to your question, it of course relates, because at the end of the day, you know, that's what we, I think, why we need art in the mix right now. And that's why uh, politics and the world needs art more than ever before, you know. And John Latham and Barbara Stevini, the two seminal English artists, said in the 1960s already that every government uh, every big organization, every corporate uh, organization should have an artist in residence, you know, should have an artist at the center. So every mayor, every prime minister, every, you know, big brand, big corporate organization needs an artist in the center. And if I think, you know, we want mondialité in the 21st century, which I think is essential and urgent, you know, art can help us a lot towards that. And uh, so I would like to say, you know, we at the same time, believe a lot in that John Lace and Barbara Stevini idea. We just positioned Pedro Reyes with the mayor's office, so we spend a lot of time to find ecological solutions. You know, for London, we're talking to a lot of companies. You know, working closely with also digital and technology companies to bring artists in the very centre. So this idea to not only do exhibitions, to not only, but to actually bring art into the core of society. Um, so, what chances do do small uh, artists from small contexts like ours have on the global stage? Would, would they? Do you think that you know a Maltese artist can make it internationally, become a big name? From yeah. your experience, yeah, my experience, experience is that you know I I went in the 90s, you know, because we of course 
the art world has always been chasing that one center, you know, and Paris lost the avant-garde, as Gibault says famously, to New York after the Second World War. And when I started in the 80s, you know, that started to change. And we made that decision, that was my generation of curators made that decision in the early 90s, that we wanted a polyphony of centers. We wanted to break the mon monopoly of these few art centers and have a, mon have, have a polyphony, right? It's again a glissantian notion. So I went to Glasgow at the very beginning of the 90s and I saw this amazing Glasgow region art scene. It was as exciting as London. So I said, you know, this is an extraordinary art scene. Then I went to Scandinavia and I saw amazing art. So I started to realize, you know, there is this polyphony all over. And then, of course, I went to all continents. My research brought me to all continents. And I found exciting art scenes in so many places. And that, of course, means that artists no longer, you know, that artists no longer need to leave. Because until the 80s, artists always felt compelled that they needed to go to Paris or to New York. They needed to leave the context. And that is a devastating effect on the local context, because it means a brain drain, right? Artists who permanently leave. And, uh, and that no longer is the case, and that's something, you know, which I think we are still working on, we need to work on it every day. But I believe in that today, I believe that, you know, Malta is an extraordinary, you know, art center, and particularly if we think about, you know, this Glissantian idea of the archipelago, uh, Malta is very well positioned to play a key role in the 21st century, because it's not the continental logic. And he says, you know, the, uh, the archipelago logic is a welcoming and sheltering logic as opposed to the continental logic, you know, which is not welcoming. And so in a way, this sort of uh, idea is, I think, very, you know, fitting for the 21st century. And I think also many artists at the moment are interested in this idea of, um, of archipelagos. So, Georgina, I have to um, now come to you, because um, Hans has just mentioned the uh, archipelago perspective. How, how do you envisage Micah's um, in this scenario? Well, um, definitely, Micah's, um, Micah's vision is, is essentially to create um, a, a very transnational space. We're, you know, we, we have long discussions, and I think through the years we have had long discussions about insularity or whether we should um, you know, do this or that, but in creating our own uh, uh, national platform for contemporary art, I think that is the first step to, to validate artists. Um, I, I think that's a very imp important step in that sense. But also to, uh, to, to see um, what we, we ourselves can offer in that sense. Um, and necessarily, you know, not necessarily um, be too exonormative in, in how we, we approach things. We do have that tendency in, in that sense. Uh, thinking that the best way sometimes of moving forward is to you know import an idea wholesale and not not quite um, value what uh, you know what uh, what we as a uh, you know as a uh, as an island here right in between two continents but essentially having a, a different um, uh, negotiate you know we negotiate the world in different ways too and and perhaps that can can also um, uh, you know, bring bring others to uh, to uh, you know to share with us, and we share with them what uh, you know what we would like our our uh, you know what our perspective is. And I think it, that that sort of dislocation is a is a is something that Mikeus would like to. Um, this is not about you know being a, a, a reference point, but this but this but uh, um, more the case of. Uh, pushing forward an idea that can, you know, can be interesting and can, you know, bring artists over uh, who, who are, you know, interested in, in looking at the way we view the world too. Okay, thank you. Um, now, this brings me to something which uh, we were discussing with Sarah before. We've had a very interesting conversation, actually, before coming here. Um, Sarah, you, you said that um, the question in the coming years will be whether Malta will stabilize, sustain and develop its presence internationally uh, in the art scene, or will it revert to traditional forms of patronage that may not enable artists to engage at a higher level? It's an interesting question to ask because um, very often, traditionally, our art is depended on patrons and possibly in the privacy of their studios they produced art which was quite different from what they were uh, producing for their patrons. 
And I lived in Malta now for a, over a little bit over a year. And I think we are really much at a crossroad right now because, um, well, Valletta has been the capital of culture now for, for 10 months, you know, so we are about to get to the end of it. And we have Catherine Tabon here today. Um, we are in a booming economy and we have two museums in the making, Musa and Micas. And it's very important to understand, especially when we speak about internationalization, whether this internationalization will be relevant, you know, for the art community and for all, actually for all the other countries. In fact, um, when we do internationalization, especially in a very uh, globalized competitive environment as we have right now, as Anz Ulrich was mentioning, um, you really have to be sure that, first of all, you're not losing your soul. Because, you know, it, you know as you get into these transactions, you know, it can, uh, that could be the first, the first problem. And, and second, that you are actually able to engage in a real transnational conversation. And uh, um, that has something to say in this very hyper-connected and, uh, and uh, challenging high-speed society. So I come from a country, Italy, that uh, has been uh, on the periphery for quite a while. And I think in a way it still is. Um, that because, unfortunately, when we were uh, doing, you know, when we were trying to develop programs that were supposed to actually uh, support our art community, we were just trying to stay alive. And, and we were not really thinking about the artists. So now we finally have two programs that um, I think uh, will uh, make a big change and maybe they will also uh, stop the brain drain problem that we have. And one is actually a program of the Ministry of Culture. It's called the Italian Council. And it's a grant that's given to artists that are making new projects in collaboration with international institutions. Ouch. And the second one is actually has been developed by Quadriennale. Uh, I don't know how many of you knows what Quadriennale is, but Quadriennale is a national institution devoted to promoting uh, Italian art, and has been there for quite some time. Um, but for as long as I can remember, Quadriennale were really striving to keep going instead of taking care of Italian artists. Now, with the new director, Sara Kosulic, who was appointed just last year, we have a new program that's called, uh, that's a bi um, biannual grant, it's called the Coup International, and it's actually uh, giving funds to artists who are invited to exhibit in international institutions. That means that the institution is achieving two goals. The first goal is for the first time in its very long life, is actually developing an international network. And the second goal is actually helping Italian artists to have their work exhibited abroad. So you can make a difference and sometimes it's not a matter of, you know, of having big budgets. You just have to focus on the right direction. A challenge at an institutional level where you need, um, you know, at the top, people who are the, the leaders in the artistic field. You need some, it's important to have continuity. Um, but then change is also important. And also, you know, when it comes to um, practitioners. Um, Edith, from your experience in, in London, um, and also, the, what, how, how do you see this? Do you think it is important that um, you find a balance, you strike a balance between continuity and also the, uh, giving the opportunity for the younger generation somehow to be able to assert itself? Absolutely. I mean, I, I, I think it is, um, uh, we have to support the, the younger generation of artists coming through all the time. And, and it, it interested me very much what's been said um, already by members of the panel about sort of different, different centres and that there's no, you know, there's no longer a centre for art. It's, it's possible to establish your centre wherever. And of course that allows young artists to um, 
create their own centres, even at a very local level, but at a, and then to, to, to get onto a bigger stage as well. And it is, I mean, it is liberating now that there are possibilities to create sort of centres of art, groups of artists working in particular ways anywhere, and it's no longer dominated by those places, which have got huge collections, because I think that maybe, you know, when you think about Paris and London and, and New York as being centre of the arts in the past, they, they've got huge collections there, which is, has um, dominated the thinking of the artists who've worked there in the time. And there's a sense of liberation now that, that you, you know, that, that isn't as important as it used to be. Um, the idea of kind of um, continuity is, is, is a fascinating one. The idea of um, um, soft power and how that is, has been utilised is, is a very interesting one as well. And I think, you know, one of the... The clearest examples of, um, of the recognition of the potential of art power um, by state agents was in the, the late 1950s when um, the Museum of Modern Art took a touring exhibition of um, abstract expressionism, although they didn't call it that, they called it um, a New American Painting, and they brought it to Europe to 10 different venues. They were making a point, there was a nationalism behind it, which I think is, it feels very, very old-fashioned today. But of course, what we know now, that people didn't know at the time, was it was actually funded by the ICA. Went to all of these European cities. And it was making, it was making two important points. It was saying, how free our artists are. Look at this art, it's very radical, it's very different. American artists are allowed total creativity and this is what they produce. Interestingly, it didn't actually have that much purchase in, um, in America at the time. But the other um, thing to take away from it is that so many of those American artists came from different countries in Europe. It was such a kind of amalgamation of different cultures who had all kind of influenced each other in different ways. That's what made the movement exciting. I mean, we can see that from an art historical perspective, but from a kind of political perspective, it was also talking about that kind of cultural um, and, and uh, freedom and, and the welcome that um, a country like America used to give to, um, to, to artists from all over the world. Okay. Um, Catherine, you, you are now um, heading the uh, Valletta Foundation, 2018 yes. Foundation, and I'm sure that you, you have ample experience, you, opt, you gained experience in, in the past year or so, uh, on top of your previous experience. Um, how important is cultural diplomacy for Malta? Well, um, uh, cultural diplomacy over the past years has gained um, a lot of traction. Um, uh, not just um, through discussions and in theory, but we have also seen some examples in practice taking place. Um, so over the past years, uh, the Ministry for Foreign Affairs has had the Cultural Diplomacy Fund, which allows embassies to uh, select artists and uh, export their product, um, uh, not just in terms of what they create artistically, but also in terms of um, uh, the bilateral um, encounters that art can negotiate um, between the sending country and receiving one. So we have seen over the past years um, various artists um, taking their work abroad, not just in terms of visual arts, but here we are talking about arts in general. Um, um, the, the performing arts as well have been, have been um, benefiting from the Cultural Diplomacy Fund. But that's not just the only example that I can give. That's not just the only concrete thing that's happened over the past years. Um, coming from Valletta 18 Foundation, I can of course talk about my experience with bringing over artists from abroad and taking artists beyond our shores. Uh, we have had some very important names uh, linked to our foundation, linked to our initiatives. Um, in our discussion before, uh, we mentioned um, an artist from Africa and I'm sure that um, this topic will be um, developed uh, by my colleague. Um, uh, Ibrahim Mahama, who has worked on our Dalbahar Madwara um, visual arts exhibition. Um, at the moment, we also have Rosa Martinez, um, who needs no introduction, and she is curating our Constellation exhibition, um, which will be the second main uh, visual arts exhibition taking place as part of Valette 18. I am also here seeing some artists that have taken, that have worked with us um, and have contributed with their, with their works as part of the foundation. 
Um, uh, and even though, of course, what we do focuses mostly um, um, on creating um, a product that's for the local audience, but we have also developed a lot of international discussions with artists from abroad, um, uh, not just in terms of what they create, but also in terms of um, discourse that we do together. Um, so we don't just help art come about, but we also try to understand the processes that make it happen and what is most relevant in today's globalized environment. Um, going back a few years as well, um, uh, as part of my, pre my previous life as Director for Culture, um, uh, we place a lot of importance on exporting art abroad. Um, we had some seminal uh, events taking part, taking place with, um, uh, on a bilateral level with various states and even with the Vatican. So we have not just limited ourselves to working with the traditional governments, but we have also exported um, our artists and helped them develop in, in perhaps platforms that are not usually available to them. Um, so yes, to go back to your question, um, I think cultural diplomacy is gaining a lot of importance and it's not, just, it's not just a concerted effort, but I think it's the way that the world is going nowadays. Um, um, ultimately, culture is not just um, uh, what brings us together, but it's not just a bridge, but it's a common language. Um, and it comes into a lot when um, words fail and when there's a problem with understanding each other, there comes art, which creates the common language and the common vocabulary that we can all understand. The ambassador designated to Ethiopia and the African Union. Uh, now, how can your role as a diplomat um, uh, provide opportunities or create opportunities for MICAS and other artistic organizations to reach out to the Global South? I'm looking for my throne, yeah. <laughs> Big time. When we're talking about the Global South, I'm going to focus on Africa. And um, I think that it's absolutely vital that we use the arts to engage with Africa because the key elements of engagement with Africa are probably three words. Create a new dialogue, um, engage, but the most important word is listen. Now, I don't think that we're ready to talk to Africa yet because even using the word to talk to Africa for me is problematic. We need to first of all start listening to Africa. We need to get into the rhythm of Africa, today's rhythm. I don't mean um, Papa Diddley or any rap music. We need to understand what the concerns of Africa are. So I think that um, it's absolutely vital that we create, through the arts, a platform to talk to Africa today and to understand how Africa aspires to be in the future. And this isn't, this isn't just in the arts. I'm intrigued by the idea that across Africa today, there are 120 European universities operating in Africa. There isn't a single African university operating in Europe. Why is, the, why is it the case that the dialogue is from the north to the south? So I believe that Malta can provide a bridge. Um, why is Malta special? You know, why should the bridge connect through Malta? Well, I think we are special. Um, uh, we have a special history. Um, our history is one of a colonized country, uh, brutalized as well. We know what it's like to have achieved our independence and to have achieved our confidence. So I think that within the European Union, there are not many countries that have been through the experience that binds us with Africa. We are on the African plate. This will annoy many people who look towards Europe all the time, but we are actually on the African plate. If you walk through the countryside, you'll see the Cape Sorel, uh, Arsu. You'll see prickly pears. Prickly pears take me straight through to Ethiopia. They don't take me to Estonia. So we are connected geographically. We're connected in terms of history. We're, in ter we're also connected in terms of trade. We have a lot of trade that takes place with Africa which doesn't get recognized. When it comes to the arts, Unfortunately, it seems to me that we're not connected at all. And my first question is, are we interested in connecting? And do we recognize true quality when it comes our way? 
So although we talk about the arts and Malta is a place where Passmore lived and Malta is a place where Thackeray and, and everybody came through Malta, we, we know that, we've been taught that. But have we been told how, how many famous Africans came through Malta? So the arts, I think, are a vital place where we can sit down and talk and actually listen to people, but more importantly we can create something new and we can develop a new partnership which will not only benefit and enrich Malta, but should also benefit the European Union. I was wondering, um, perhaps you, you can elaborate, uh, what do you think about initiatives like the Guggenheim, uh, Guggenheim in Bilbao or um, the Louvre in Abu Dhabi or the Serpentine in uh, Beijing? What, what that does do these in, these initiatives contribute to cross-cultural interactions, or are they like you know silos that exist in in an international context? Yeah, so we actually, with the Serpentine, have decided, you know, not to open Serpentines, uh, you know, elsewhere, to basically, but to find another way of engaging, um, which is mainly through the touring of our exhibitions. Uh, and also now, you know, of course, through the opening up of pavilions, so we've just opened the Serpentine Pavilion in Beijing, um, but this does not mean, you know, franchising, this does not mean to kind of put the franchise, but it's the opposite. It's all about Glissant. You see, I read Edouard Glissant every morning for 15 minutes. It's all inspired by that. So he basically says, if you want to do Mondialité, we need to always listen to the local context, and we need to find out what does the local context need. So when we work in a place, you know, we're not just touring and doing the same thing we do in London. Because the pavilion in London is something else than a pavilion in Beijing. So we, you know, made a lot of research, went to hundreds of architect studios in Beijing, and then invited a Chinese architect, you know, to design the pavilion. We developed with local, you know, practitioners a completely local program. So in a way, it's not this idea of an export, you know. It's, and I think it's important, you know, because I think the 20th century was a lot about manifestos, they were often, you know, loud. And I think the 21st century assessed the poet Etel Adnan, she always says, the, the, the great artist, and poet Etel Adnan from you know, Lebanon who lives in Paris, she always says, you know, we have to learn to listen. And I think that's, you know, a very important aspect. And then create these crossroads. Of course, we want to create. So for Jana, Peel and me, it's very important to create all these dialogues. And that means something very, for us, very important, which is not just opening up, you know, franchise, but the opposite is actually lots of local partnerships. And that means, you know, more new alliances. I think we need in the 21st century new alliances. And that means not only between arts organizations, you know, I think it would be very boring if we would just collaborate with other museums only. That would be very limiting. No, we work with technology institutes, we work with scientific organizations, we work with, you know, we now have a curator of ecology, Jana Peel and I, our CEO and I, decided that, you know, an organization needs a curator of ecology, needs also a chief technology officer. Um, so we have basically, you know, outreach to also a lot of activist groups. These are all alliances we are, we are fostering, in a way. And I think that's important because we can only solve the big, um, we can only solve the big challenges of the 21st century if we bring together, you know, all the disciplines. And uh, that means also sometimes, you know, for cultural, ambassadors, it can happen in a very unexpected context. And embassies, I'm so delighted that an ambassador is with us present, you know, today, because embassies play a key role in that. You know, I, as a kid, when I grew up in Switzerland, you know, we decided to do this big, one of my first big shows was about Asian art, and we went to Asia, and with Wuhan Ru did this exhibition, Cities on the Move. And the, the Swiss embassy in Beijing was the headquarters for our research, because Uli Sik, you know, it's much more important than any museum, because Uli Sik decided that the Swiss embassy, you know, would support Chinese art, and would be this exchange between art and make art central. An embassy can play a key role in that. So we need alliances between universities, embassies, museums. So it's wonderful, I think, that you brought together here on this panel, you know, representatives from, from museums, locally and globally, that you brought together your university, and embassy. It's the first time that I experienced that in a panel, and I think it's a, a very brilliant move. Thank you. 
Sarah, what, about, what are your thoughts about these, this? I totally agree with what Dan just said. I mean, it's important to create association, create local partnerships. But that's true that many times you speak about art and internationalization and people will think about Louvre Abu Dhabi and Guggenheim uh, Bilbao. And, and I have to say that being a freelance curator, it happens very often that your audience doesn't have quite the same expectation that you have, you know, in just like translating, uh, you know, such a keyword like internationalization. Um, so when, when you think of, for example, of Louvre Abu Dhabi, that is just in his first years of activities, you think, of course, of this spectacular architecture that's being built you think of the incredible media outreach worldwide. You know, this is making sponsors very happy. And, and you know, and that's a fact. So, but, so it, it is a way of, you know, thinking internationalization, but it's just one very specific side of it. And um, for example, if you think of United Arab Emirates, they have provided very, very little conceptually to this institution. You basically, everything stands on a contract between Louvre and, you know, and the hosting country. And to give you some hardcore facts, we're talking about a contract of 663 million pounds. And it's a contract that only provides for branding, programming, and, um, and uh, um, borrowing of 300 artworks from the Louvre collection. And we are speaking about a collection of 380,000 artworks. So the, the real question here is like, can we build bridges that are actually sustainable? To do that, I think we should you know, rely much more on cooperation and collaboration. You know, this, the contract between Louvre and United Arab Emirates is only 30 years long. So what's going to happen when you finish, you know, this six hundred million pounds and uh, you know and the 30 years you know loan you have to start from scratch because actually the art community will have not benefited from this at all mm -hmm. Edith what, what do you think and and I know that you organized um, tour exhibitions what the, what do um, the receiving countries benefit from uh, apart from okay <coughs> appreciating the art itself but do they um, gain anything else beyond that? Yes, I mean, uh, touring for me, I, I agree with Hans Ulrich that it's, it's, it's one of the most important things that I, I feel I do is to tour an exhibition. But it is something that's so important that it's collaborative, that you're working with, um, with a, a curator from the receiving country, the receiving venue, to shape the exhibition in a particular way so that there is this feeling of it's not just you working on it, but their input becomes very important. And it, it's such an exciting thing to do as a curator because you, you form the exhibition in one place. For me, it's the Royal Academy of Arts in London. You take it somewhere else and reconfigure it, and reconfigure it with, with much more input from the, the people there that understand their audience and their culture more. And it's fascinating. I learned so much about the exhibition, but also about their culture at the same time. And it's, it, you know, it, it's, a, it's a very important thing to do. Just going back to the idea of, of um, the, the Guggenheim and, and, and Abu Dhabi, I'm, I'm not trying to defend them, but I think one of the exciting things and the opportunities that they offer is bringing collections to other communities and for artists, young artists in, in those communities to see them. Because you know we know that um, that's enormously stimulating for any artist to, to, to see these rich collections. Um, but I think they're very problematic. I mean, I, I've worked at the, at the Guggenheim in Bilbao many times, so I understand the building, I love the building. Um, and it has completely regenerated the, 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 um, the town. Bilbao was, was, was on its knees before the Guggenheim came. That's a, kind of, that's a whole other discussion. But it's a very interesting thing how something cultural can completely regenerate and re-energize a whole community and become such a kind of beacon within Spain. It's not just Bilbao, it's a whole area. People come from Madrid to see exhibitions there, so that becomes quite exciting. But yes, there are problems with them, um, with these big global institutions spreading out. And I'm, I'm not trying to defend it, but there are positives there as well. Yeah, I agree with that fully, you know, I didn't, uh, so my comments are not at all saying 
that these institutions are, you know, it's not good that they exist because of course also, you know, it is very important that there is a museum with a collection because we, you know, I grew up in Zurich and I went every day to the Kunsthaus Zurich collection and that was like my school. So it is important that every place has this place where we can go and, and learn. It's like a school. Sure. Okay, before we continue, I said earlier that this is going to be a conversation. So I'm wondering if you have any points which you would want to put across or any questions at this stage. I'm sure, I'm sure, I mean, uh, I, I need to encourage you a bit further, I'm sure that, the, that you can um, point out or there are things which you would like to say. No? You're here to listen. Well, usually you're a vocal lot and, and you know, artists and what have been um, very vocal in demanding a, a, a national space for art, so, you know, it's, it would be good to, to, to have some form of interaction when, when you have the possibility. So, I mean, we, we all want to listen and, and I think that is a, you know, I, I, I will... Uh, I think that this, this, this is a space where we can do that. Oh, okay, sorry. Yes, okay. Thank you. I'm not uh, in the art world, so I'm speaking as an ordinary person, listening to what has been going on so far. And uh, the idea of internationalization, I like what the ambassador designate to Ethiopia said. I come from Ghana. So I speak about Ghana. You've been talking about collections. And you've also said through art, you have your national identity and all that. I'm not sure whether we have collections. We have some very good creative uh, artists, those who paint and uh, sculptors and a whole lot. But it is still not that, or I wouldn't say it's not developed, but looking at art from the Western side, when we go to school, what we learn is what is taught in the Western world. But when you are in Ghana and you are talking about art, the ordinary person appreciates some things. Our chiefs, they are installed, you know, so we have stools. And you, we say that the master craftsman, the type of wood that you are given, whether it is crooked, straight, you make something and everybody can tell that you have a very artistic art, uh, eye, that, you know, you are very, very dexterous and all that. So you take an ordinary person and the person can appreciate it and tell you why it is uh, one of the best. When you show a, you know, a painting with uh, a name to many people who are very educated, they may not even know who uh, did it to start with and they will not be able to tell you why it is so internationally recognized. So when I listen to these things, I realize that we are not in the conversation at all. The things that we appreciate, you know, like bead making, it is in its own class. And people will tell you why this is the best, why this is flawed, why this is this. And they can tell you which part of the country you can get the best from. And it's a way of expressing ourselves. And we know where you have the best collections and all that. We were colonized. There were some artistic pieces that found uh, themselves in other places, you know, and we still crave, you, you know, for those things because we understand them. So I'm asking myself, how do we become part of that conversation? Because at the moment, we are not. You know, it's a what's very interesting question. Yeah. Yeah. How do you become part of the conversation? Any ideas? Rod, uh, Ron? It's a vital conversation. 
And I find it extraordinary that um, when, as students, if you want to study African arts, you tend to immediately go to Università di Studi di Bologna or to SOAS or places like that. At a time when we have the European Union encouraging us essentially to create here in Malta a centre for the study of African art. And in creating a centre for the study of African art, we should be reaching out to African academics, African experts, etc., etc. So I take that message completely. Um, I'm looking at this perhaps more from the university perspective as a challenge that we have an opportunity to create programmes in the African arts which are delivered in partnership with African institutions. I don't believe that that is being done enough in Europe. There are many reasons for that. The issuing of visas is problematic. The movement of artists is hugely problematic. So I'm very realistic about this. I think there are, you know, Trump is building a wall across Mexico. Europe has an even more impenetrable wall because artists cannot travel and this is something that we also need to factor in. I don't want to be controversial about walls and visas, but I think that it needs to be placed on the table. In terms of the specificity of African art, there are wonderful artists, Pajo, Ghanaian artists, who create um, coffins art. Mm -hmm. In Ghana they have this wonderful tradition. When you die, you, you, die in, you live in style in Ghana, you die in style as well. <laughs> um, uh, Opoku. Ooh, I've got her first name here, it's uh, Zora Poku, and she looks at the mysticism and spirituality issues. Even this dialogue is becoming strange for us in Europe. The, the whole issue of contemporary religions and art is perhaps an area, I'm not an artist, but I would like to look at African art in more detail. I appreciate the issues, and I think that Malta should be raising these issues at the highest of levels, not simply passively engaging in Europe, but actually saying, guys, this needs to be done. We have a voice in Europe, let's use it. So the politics of art goes as well with the building of art centers. So I think that... A very important point. Yeah, I think it's so grateful that you asked this question. Also, <coughs> Ghana is always uh, on my mind because we actually went there. We made a research. It's so important to enable beginnings also of artists, you know, because very often it's at the very beginnings when artists start that we need to support them. So we started this project with my colleague Simon Castel some years ago called 89 Plus, where we basically enable a generation of artists born after 89. It's the first generation who grew up with the internet. Um, and we traveled through many, many cities and spent uh, a lot of time also in um, uh, Accra actually doing research amazing generation of artists there, who, who, like Elizabeth Sutherland, for example, a visionary artist who works between theatre and, uh, and visual arts, and then, you know, brought these artists also to Google, to the Google residency, which was interesting to basically connect them to technology. Uh, and of course, Ghana is always on our mind, also through our trustee at the Serpentine, David Arge, the eminent architect, who is so engaged now with basically building, you know, uh, important aspects of uh, um, of, of, uh, of, of, of new, new structures in Ghana. But I think one thing which is important to bring it back to Malta, because we need to bring it back to Malta, is I think this idea how we can build such dialogues not only you know, to London, to Paris, but how can there suddenly be a dialogue between Malta and Ghana. You know? And I think residencies, as we did it with 89 Plus and with you know, Elizabeth Sutherland, for example, um, residencies are really very important because residencies Museums are very important, so it's essential that the museum is built here, because a, a museum is a, f a fundamental thing. It's almost like everybody has the right to have a museum, and ideally these museums have free admission. I believe that in a society of inequality, museums should be free, because uh, if we basically charge, we exclude a certain percentage of people from exhibitions, and so that's why the Serpentine, you know, we having 1.2 million visitors a year with free admission, and that's one of the uh, for me, one of the fundamental things, you know, in, in an age of inequality, we need to counter that by making it free. But I think in addition to a museum, we need residences. And we spoke about that earlier this afternoon in your office, and we had this pre-think tank, wonderful conversation for, for the conference. And, and residences are so key, you know, I'm the product of a residency. When I was like 22, I was stuck in Switzerland, I had no money to travel, I could take a little bit of night trains, but I couldn't really travel. And so then the Gartier Foundation gave me a grant and they liberated me, you know, I could suddenly travel. I was in Paris for three months and everything I've done 
well, thanks to this residency, you know, in a way. And I think residencies are an amazing tool to bring the local and the global together. So the Gatti Foundation invited curators, young artists, you know, in the early 90s, I was there with Huang Yongping from China, the young Chinese artist, uh, with Absalon, the sculptor from Israel, and, we, and then some local artists. And so, in a way, to have a really strong residency program where many local and global artists meet, you know, and that's how then these bridges can be built. These bridges can be built, you know, from Malta to Accra, from Malta. And I agree with you that that connection to Africa is absolutely, you know, essential in terms of so many extraordinary art centers in Africa. But it's important also to connect Malta, you know, to all other continents. It's important to connect Malta to Latin America. To, and, and in a way, this, this idea of a residency is a great way of doing it because it means it's also longer term than just an exhibition. Because with an exhibition, people fly in and out. It's like a pop-up, you know? And they're here for three days. But when you have a residency, you have an artist in town for three months or six months, and there is a deep relationship because their friends visit them, they become friends with local artists. I mean, I had this residency in Paris in 91, and ever since, you know, I have so many friends in France. It's become a very important part of my life. So in terms of sustainability, I believe residences are key to, and it's also great, of course, for artists to give them access to means of production, because that's another thing, to how to put artists on a map to, is to give them means of production, uh, not only residences, but also to produce. Very interesting point, because I want to bring the conversation back to Malta's foreign policy, actually, because um, now we are opening to the Sub-Sahara um, and to, to the African Union, etc. But traditionally, our foreign policy was a Mediterranean policy. We had a Mediterranean mission. And we're living in, as I said earlier, um, in a very complex, turbulent region. Um, and my question to, to Catherine and to Georgina is whether we are looking at the MENA region. Um, uh, whether, you know, uh, in the post so-called Arab Spring, whether we have ambitions to try to reach out and build bridges with, with these countries, with whom we traditionally had direct contact. And um, it wasn't as difficult to travel there and, you know, to invite people from, from these countries. Yes, um, Carmen. So, um, also to pick up on what Hans was saying, Residencies are still in their infancy in Malta. We do have um, some programs which are working. Um, we have a residency program at uh, the Valletta 18 Foundation and there is another program at St. James Cavalier, um, the new center for creativity. But um, uh, based on my experience as well, we would have wanted to see a lot more artists from the MENA region and um, from, from Africa and also from, from other countries in general to be part of this discussion. But unfortunately, as we were saying before, the issue with visas is very prohibitive. We would have very much liked to see the regeneration that happened in Valletta being built not just from European voices and from European contributions, but also to have something that we are not too familiar with um, inject itself in, 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 in what we are accustomed to. We are lacking that, even though as a foundation we have tried as much as possible to bring over artists, not just from Europe but beyond. This We are encountering um, a wall, because that's what it really is, um, an abstract wall, um, uh, and a wall that is not actually physical. But still, we had artists that wanted to be part of our programs that we were funding fully. I know that Sandra there can, can vouch for what I am saying, and some other people from, from, from my team at the foundation who are present. We have had artists whom we were covering fully, who we wanted to bring over, who we wanted to engage in a discussion with, and in spite of our various efforts, in spite of the, also the, the unofficial element of bringing people whom you know to facilitate work, it still did not happen. So we can sit here and talk about wanting to build a world that is more inclusive through, through the arts, but we need also um, governments in general to well, be more good collaborative, will, right? yes, and to be we need more goodwill in general in, in international relations to allow us to work more for what we want to achieve. Okay. 
any other points before I, I move to, to Georgina on what we have said? Okay. The microphone is in your well, hand. You know, from our perspective, at least from, from a mica stream, it, um, the, the Mediterranean and the MENA region, um, that is uh, the Mediterranean and the Middle East, are definitely part of our, um, are very much part of our agenda. So um, residencies, particularly um, a more you know, structured residency, uh, a more long-term residency program, um, is, is what we're looking at. Uh, we're very aware of the issues of uh, artist mobility when it comes from this region. I think we, we can all agree that it has become even much more difficult um, after the Arab Spring. Um, our ties with, with North Africa and, and uh, the, the Middle East are there. Um, they have been there. I mean, um, our own history is tied up with these. We can never look away from, from, uh, you know, from our near neighbors in that sense. There are um, um, business connections, there are cultural connections, there are linguistic connections. So, you know, this is very much part of our own narrative as well. But uh, um, I'm very much aware, even in conversations we have in Europe itself, where this issue keeps cropping up, it is within, within art networks, within cultural networks, we all are very sensitized to this issue of, of uh, uh, visas and how this impairs mobility. So um, everyone is vocal where, it, where, it, you know, where we need to be vocal, but it's changing perceptions and um, making sure that the decision makers um, you know, are keen to move on this. I mean, there is some glimmer of hope uh, in the sense that if we look at um, Europe itself, there seems to be a slight rethinking. I'm not that, um, let me say, I want to be optimistic about this because there, is, there are spaces where we can make the, the case and uh, uh, definitely in terms of social inclusion and I think for, from, for a wider, um, for a much wider um, embrace, I think, and, and to make conversations happen where they need to happen too. Um, I think um, institutions, uh, particularly cultural institutions, can really make the case. There's also the issue of safe havens for artists. We know, I mean, we, we've been talking about safe havens, at least even within our own con our context and our local context, for quite some time. How we see this happen is, I, I'm, not, I'm not really sure. I would like us to be much more vocal in this and much more proactive. And definitely, that is, that is very much so on the agenda for my case. Now, there is geographic space and there is the virtual space. And we are very much trying to market Malta as the blockchain island. Uh, very recently we've had a summit, um, Malta, etc. Um, Hans, earlier you were telling me that you're quite enthusiastic about the implications of blockchain for in the art world. Can you elaborate on this? Yeah, we started uh, at the Serpentine a whole you know, series of projects which we call new experiments in art and technology because, of course, Billy Kluver in the 1960s you know, brought together artists and engineers in his famous EAT, Experiments in Art and Technology. So we made it a very strong uh, sort of leading aspect of our program to create these new experiments in art and technology, you know, following artists' interest in collaborating, you know, with, uh, with technology and with science. So we had earlier this year the first uh, artificial intelligence exhibition at the Serpentine with Ian Cheng, who created a character called Bob, Bag of Belief. And uh, so Bob took over the Serpentine and lived at the Serpentine and continues actually to live at the Serpentine beyond the exhibition. Because what we realize is that such artworks don't end with the exhibition. Uh, they also don't repeat. There isn't a loop. They are alive. So it changes quite a lot, you know, in terms of curating. Also, as they are alive, they are not necessarily, you know, responsive to whoever visits them. They have their own lives. So sometimes they can be responsive, sometimes they can ignore you. So it's a whole, you know, new experience. Then, of course, at the moment we have the exhibition with Pierre Week, which just started, which has again to do with, you know, an experiment in art and technology that has to be, has to do with machine telepathy. So he works with images directly from the brain to the machine. We no longer need a camera. Uh, and you can really see intelligence, you know, artificial intelligence at work. And then our digital commissions, like with Cecil B. Evans, or now we're working with Hito Steyer. She is working on a project with us for next February. Uh, and that has to do again also with, uh, with AI. Blockchain 
uh, is also part of that, that research. Because it is fascinating how many artists are actually interested in this decentralized aspect of blockchain. And the first artist who brought that to the Serpentine was actually Simon Denny, a New Zealand, a New Zealand artist based in Berlin, who uh, connected us to Vitalik Buterin. And Vitalik you know, invented uh, Ethereum and the Ethereum Foundation, which is of course one of the uh, currencies, uh, one of the cyber currencies, and uh, uh, it goes hand in hand with this very big foundation, the Ethereum Foundation he founded. So I then subsequently, you know, interviewed Vitalik and uh, started to become very curious to actually map together with uh, our teams, you know, to map uh, all the artist projects which are happening right now in the world um, by artists. And I think, you know, in a way we all, you know, curating always follows art. So it's not that I all of a sudden say, you know, blockchain is on the agenda, because that would be very artificial. No, it is because artists are into that, that I then follow and, uh, uh, and we are mapping that as we speak and there is actually a lot of really fascinating projects of artists working with these decentralized aspects of blockchain, artists coming up with their own coins, etc, etc. R Ronnie, do you think that um, actually developments, technological developments and then um, which, re which are resulting in blockchain, etc, uh, would we be able to overcome the barriers which we were discussing earlier? Yeah, absolutely. I think blockchain and uh, blockchain and the arts in Africa are just interlinked. And um, I'll give you an example. I think if you are an artist in Zimbabwe today, you want to be paid in Bitcoin. You don't want to be paid in Zimbabwean dollars. It's very, very simple. You want to get your work through to, um, to, through to the West, through to Europe. But I think we need to be very careful that blockchain can be a force for good or it can be a force for bad. And where blockchain can be used effectively is in ensuring that the artist gets a direct payment for his work without intermediaries, ensuring that the artist's IP is protected, ensuring that authentic um, the authenticity yeah. of the um, artwork is registered and IP'd within a European Union framework. These are very, very important um, uh, added bonuses uh, for an artist in Africa, which um, currently are simply not available. They will be available in Africa in years to come, 10 years moving ahead, but this is immediately available today. So I think that we should be having this discussion immediately today as Africa will catch up, and it will catch up very, very quickly. Kenya is going to be doing this very soon. Mm -hmm. But we have an opportunity, I think, to do this now, and it's in line with Micah's opening up. So I think that there is a convergence. Edith and Sarah, um, Hans has just, uh, he made a statement, uh, curators, they follow the art, artists. Now, how far, <laughs> how far does art reflect or how far does art follow the sign of the times, changes in society? We know that art may disrupt, it may subvert at times, you know, it can bring about change and reforms. Well, um, I think that, um, yes, it's important for artists to have some kind of connection with their society. So we've seen how internet, for example, has created an entire new, you know, area of interest for artists. Uh, you know, what was, you know, at one point was called post-internet and then a label that has very quickly became, um, become obsolete, you know, to even uh, understand what artists were trying to say you know, as they were um, speaking for their virtual experiences, virtual versus physical experiences. Um, at the same time, you have to be careful, you know, as, you know, there are this, you know, you inject, you know, for the, from the perspective of the institution, you inject these trends that have influence on what the younger generations, you know, will, will be willing to do. And uh, you have to be sure that uh, you're not creating a, a, a frame that's, you know, too tight for artists to really, uh, you know, um, express themselves. You know, sometimes we look at what's happening out there and we try to just, uh, you know, set a series, okay, you know, we are interested in post-colonialization, we are interested in uh, what's happening with the uh, with internet and digitalization. and. 
you know, and, and, and then, uh, you know, you have to make sure that you're not really, um, you know, drawing this frame and just picking artists, uh, you know, to match your discourse, but that you are just, you know, a source of inspiration and that you still uh, allow for that freedom, you know, to, to express itself. Edith, do you have anything to add to this? No, I, I, I think that's absolutely right. I completely agree with that. And I think it's, I mean, what, what's interesting about curators, um, well, some curators, myself included, is that um, sometimes you're quite late to something. You know, by the time the, the, the sort of a, a, a new way of working, a, a new kind of movement among artists has happened, the curator actually comes in quite late. So that sort of first flash of it has already happened. So th there's always that danger. By the time it comes to a formal gallery, it's it's sort of on the it can be on the downward slide, and you always feel that sense of responsibility. Are you getting the timing right? Are you killing it off and stopping anything anything more um, um, from developing because you're kind of saying this is it? And um, so there's that real sense of of responsibility. The fact of which artists reflect the, the times they live in. So many of them do to a huge extent, and I think in a way that's why. Um, the, the, the public, the, the, the people become very engaged in an artist's work because it's reflecting back a different view of their society. Um, and you can see that in kind of you know, recent movements across, um, across Europe and America. Um, but but you know, one of the really important things in thinking of, of, of Malta is, is what, what's wonderful about um, artists working in their, their community or outside artists coming in and working within a community, their work becomes a kind of expression of the confidence, you know, that cultural confidence, um, which is, is, is such an important thing. And if a, if a society is, is confident about allowing their artists to express themselves in a, in a free way, it represents a, a strong society. Okay, um, one question from Pierre. Following up on, on what Sarah was saying about. Okay, can you wait for the microphone? No, Since there is a recording. Oh, so, oh, oh, sorry, I, t I interrupted you. No, I, I was saying, like, following up um, from what Sarah was saying, from an artistic point of view, because we're talking about a panel of curators, uh, and, and on this side, from an artistic point of view, I suppose it's a case of looking for new tools rather than following a particular fashion that is, is, is happening in time. So from an artistic point of view, um, we're either using internet as a tool uh, rather than anything else, and the same way as uh, we use our historicity, uh, like many of the artists had, have used religion uh, in, in, their, in their productions, in their, in their works, so I think it is a case, what, what I need to say is, it is a case of the artist looking for different tools rather than following trends um, okay. more than yeah, anything else. It, no? yes. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah. And I think that what I was trying to say is that sometimes curators have a responsibility and sometimes also media. Uh, you know, have responsibility because what we do with media, we always try to get, you know, the topic out, mm -hmm. you know, and, and get the maximum attention. And that's when you're actually putting the artist in a box, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and that's a big mistake. But unfortunately, it's very, very difficult to actually, um, you know, find a way out of that. And, I, and I'm saying that with uh, 10 years experience, with the national newspaper. I mean, it's, uh, you try, you know, <laughs> to, to change cer certain systems, but when you're pitching, there's always that, you know, okay, what's going on in here? You know, what's the new, n newest uh, fashion trend? And thank you for using the word fashion, because I always, you know, I'm always a bit scared of using certain words, but it's like the elephant in the room. So at one point, you're gonna have to address it somehow. Mm. But I also think it's uh, about transcendence in mm -hmm. the end, you know, because I think, you know, these new tools, etc., etc., but when artists, you know, really create art, then they transcend, they transcend our time. Mm. And this is why we can look at art, you know, hundreds of years later, and it's still relevant. We can look at Goya today mm. and connect it to what's happening in Syria, you know, and, and we don't necessarily have to connect the disasters of war 
to those specific walls. So it transcends its time and also it transcends the tools of its time. And that's what's happening right now at the certain time with Pierre Week. So we have, you know, him doing this work with artificial intelligence. But what is so extraordinary is that it's completely transcending that idea. It is not a comment on artificial intelligence. It's like all great art makes the visible, the, the invisible visible. I mean, Paul Klee once said, art can make the invisible visible. And AI has been something we can't really grasp. It's pretty abstract. You know, we all read about it, but we don't really have an experience with it. It's, it's not visual, you know? And so he creates for the first time a kind of a possibility to really experience and visualize because, you know, through this mental machine, uh, you see the machine searching. So, for example, the person at the machine thinks of a specific object or being, and then the machine searches millions of images which could correspond, and you see that search thing. But at the same time, you see surrealism, you see art history, you see Max Ernst, you know, you see uh, chimeras, you see Archimbolo, and uh, all of that, you know, it's endless. I could go on for hours what you see there, and it completely transcends. And I think that's what that does. Yeah, okay, we need to conclude. And I have one question for all of you, um, if, if you don't mind. Um, so, the Malta International Contemporary Art Space will hopefully open in 2020. 2021. 2021, okay, that is the plan. <laughs> so, if we were to meet again by 20, uh, 30, 31, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> in 10 years time, ten no? years, ten time years time after years. its inauguration. Where would you like this space to be? What, how do you envisage? Where would you like, what would you like it to achieve? It's a question for all of you, starting with Georgina, because she's more familiar with the project. She even knows the completion date. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but I, I definitely want it delivered, and I definitely want it to, you know, to be a space where artists are heard and where they're very visible and uh, you know and where there's a um, you know it's an open space where, where with as you know with no barriers hopefully you know it is it is also um, uh, well uh, visited by the neighboring communities and that is where I really wanted to see I mean uh, I, I see it as a, an inclusive space that can be very proactive in uh, uh, telling the world what we, we can, you know, we can bring to this table, but what, you know, what essentially, um, uh, you know, I would like to leave it in the hands of artists. I mean, this is where I would like to see it in, you know, the coming years. in the coming years, perhaps because I'm very tired already. <laughs> so. Ron? I'm a boring bureaucrat, <laughs> but uh, I have a radical vision, and it would be that... You have uh, a radical heart. Well, maybe. <laughs> I'm getting old. Um, I'd like to think of uh, the centre as, um, and I'm going to take the Serpentine's line, a safe place for unsafe ideas. Mm. A place where Malta will not have imposed ideas on Africa, but will have nurtured new ideas, and I'm going to be explicit, I'm referring to LGBTIQ, I'm referring to solidarity with marginated communities, but I'm also radical in the sense that I don't want it to be the Guggenheim, I don't, would not want it to be a British uh, Tate. I want it to live on air, I don't want it to live on the proceeds from the extractive industries. I want it to create uh, revenue streams which do tap in to global wealth, I'm not naive, but which do that in a manner which is ethical and which truly promotes communication um, so that we can be proud of it. Thank you. Catherine? Uh, so, um, uh, judging also from the way that uh, things are developing in Malta, um, uh, when it comes to the arts, I would very much like to see, and I'm sure that this will also take place, um, I would very much like to see MICAS giving the agency to Malta to become one of the main artistic hubs, not just in Europe and in the Mediterranean, but even further beyond. Um, and I think with, with the vision that, that Georgina has expressed, um, which is that this would be a place for artists that would be actually run by artists in terms of the creative output that, that they exhibit and that they work on in this, in this environment. 
I think that if we allow artists more freedom and more, um, more, more chance to build the world in a way that they want to, I think that would be beneficial not just for, for Malta as a state, but also for Malta as a population. Well, in, in 10 years' time, um, I, I would very much like it to have established its own identity. Um, because that's that's one of the most important things for it to be other than anything else and not follow any any model other than its own and um, for it to be a place where anything can happen all the surprising for a sense that it's it's um it, it's somewhere where any artist anywhere in the world has sees sees themselves showing and has it has a relevance but but most importantly to be completely embraced by the the community here um, and 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 you know that means it will it will have great energy and great relevance within the culture of Malta. Sarah, well, from my experience, um, Malta needs to get out of its part timer, you know, um, let's say um, experience. So what I'm saying is that you know, to, for Malta to grow up you know to go to the next level we have to um we have to give uh, cultural people and i mean artists i mean art professionals i mean curators uh the 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 possibility to sustain their activity so i see the museum as a chance you know to really start building up you know this community and and let it free from uh, you know part-time jobs because and, 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 and until you actually can you know, um, spend all your time in being an artist, in being a curator, in writing about art, in, uh, you know, in engaging critical thinking, it's going to be very, very difficult you know, for Malta to, to succeed. Hans, your last word. Yeah, so many great definitions here. Yeah. It's difficult to, you know, to add one. Uh, as mentioned before, you know, I believe that it needs to be about new alliances. So I hope it's going to be a place for many such new alliances. I think, you know, of course, art is led. And art led, as you already said, I think we can only understand the forces of art <coughs> if we also understand what's happening in science, in music, in literature, in all these other disciplines. So I think not only, you know, alliances with many geographies, but also alliances beyond the disciplinary boundaries um, are, are very important. And then, of course, the world, and that leads us back to Eduard Glissant, who calls it the All-World Museum. So I hope mm -hmm. it's going to be an All-World Museum in the sense of what Glissant said, that the idea of a 21st century institution is to bring the world into contact with the world, to bring some of the world's places into contact with other of the world's places. And that, of course, means, as Glissant says, that we must multiply the number of worlds inside the museum. So I hope it's going to be a place of such multiplication of worlds. And there could not be a better place for that than Malta. Because as José Luis Borges, the great Argentinian poet, suggested, those born in big countries are paradoxically in danger of becoming provincial through their lack of exposure to a multiple identity. Thank you so much. I would like to thank all the speakers, our eminent speakers today, and I would like to thank you for um, joining our conversation. Um, and I hope that we will be able to meet quite soon in other activities organized by, by my class and other activities that are organized on campus. Thank you.